but we're here to understand. And, you know, we have to also not necessarily definitively condemn uh, as if we were dealing with pure evil, but recognize that the evildoers in question are themselves, you know, human. And that's, that's part of Vonnegut as well. This is not to forgive, but to understand. My name is Luis Gonzalez Saponte. I will be your co-host along with writer and scholar of genocide studies, Saba Karim. Today we will be discussing Adolf Eichmann and Mother Night, the 1961 novel by Kurt Vonnegut, with our guest, Robert Talley, professor of English at Texas State University. Please enjoy our conversation. Rob is very fondly and affectionately known to us in our circles as the living monument of St. Marcus because of all his great books, his great writings, and also a vonoisseur um, because of his expertise in Kurt Vonnegut's uh, writings. To first start off, Dr. Robert Talley, can I ask you to go ahead and please provide us with a brief synopsis of Mother Night for our listeners who are not acquainted with the book or with Kurt Vonnegut? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's a, it's certainly an uh, an odd book um, uh, uh, for for Vonnegut and and in, in general, I think. Um, and I apologize uh, uh, because I may give spoilers uh, as I go through talking about the book, but it's presented as the memoirs of Howard W. Campbell, an American-born uh, playwright living in Germany during the uh, 30s who then becomes a Nazi propagandist, given his uh, connections um, uh, in the theater uh, uh, while he was in Germany. Um, and it turns out that he is also perhaps not actually a Nazi propagandist, but a secret agent working for the United States, uh, a character he calls his blue fairy godmother, um, uh, recruits him to serve the United States. And his service is quite odd because he gives his horrible uh, anti-Semitic uh, rants on uh, the radio, becomes very famous. This is a fictional thing, of course, but he becomes very famous in Germany during the war for his um, you know, radio broadcast. But the idea is that his uh, the CIA or the predecessor of the CIA, I guess, um, had uh, arranged to have secret coded messages in his work that even he didn't know about. They came from, say, pauses or um, you know punctuation, not even like giving a code word message. So he didn't even know the messages he was given, but he was told he is helping the American war effort. Uh, and providing information secretly. Um, and so it sets up a kind of moral question, which is that, uh, and relevant to this uh, panel about, you know, uh, especially if we want to think about perpetrators, you know, a propagandist for the Nazis was obviously helping the genocide along, not just helping make it a popular thing, but, you know, making anti-Semitism and uh, other forms of genocidal hatred very acceptable and even celebrated. Um, but if he knew all along that he's really helping the good guys, is he really, you know, is he really a Nazi? And there's a sort of key moment in the book, um, which I may, you know, quote from later, but where a character, you know, basically says, well, you, you certainly were a Nazi, you know, even if you were helping us, you, you, you know, you certainly very lustily gave this, this horrible propaganda. And, and so the, the question uh, that Vonnegut later, when he wrote a, a separate preface to this, he said, of all the books he had written so far, this is the one that has a moral that he knows. And of course, that moral is, we are what we pretend to be. So we should be careful what we pretend to be. And it's, a, it's, a, it's as I say, a very, very um, odd novel um, because it, it's, other than that preface, it's presented as Howard W. Campbell's own um, confession, uh, literally written while he is in a Jerusalem jail cell awaiting trial for war crimes. Um, and so the story is told in retrospect uh, by him. So Vonnegut had created a character uh, with this uh, really bizarre, you know, um, uh, backstory uh, 
uh, to then be his narrator. And the question, you know, comes up, how, how much are we going to trust his version of events since he's a propagandist and a playwright uh, by, by trade? Um, you know, there's all kinds of interesting sort of literary critical questions. In, in Vonnegut's own career, I would also just add real quickly, this is his third novel uh, of what would become 13 or 14 novels, depending on how you count them in his career. And he's still relatively unknown. Uh, in fact, this book was published only in like cheap paperbacks. He couldn't get a proper, um, you know, major publishing house to to release a hardcover until years later. Um, uh, he gets an agent who helps him re-release his books, and and then they start getting reviewed. To my knowledge, this book wasn't reviewed at all when it first came out. Mm -hmm. uh, later, a New York Times review uh, came out of the nineteen sixty six edition. Mm -hmm. So Vonnegut is. Um, writing this really ingenious thing, but he's an utterly unknown writer <laughs> at the time. Uh, um, thank you for that context yeah. for the novel and for Kurt Vonnegut. Sala, I understand that a very prolific character comes out in the book, which is the character of Adolf Eichmann, a historical, and notorious one. Can you go ahead and give our audience who isn't acquainted um, with the history of Adolf Eichmann perhaps some context? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think it's important to point out that even if uh, Eichmann is a minor character in the novel, uh, what is interesting and important at that point in time, and we will speak about that in more detail, Adolf Eichmann's trial took place in 1961 in, in Israel. And we must remember that he was a very important figure uh, in the Holocaust in the sense that he's the one who organized the deportation of millions of Jews to death camps during the Second World War. And also he wrote important memoirs that we will probably speak about in a while because that's also mentioned in the book. Now, these memoirs were not published or they were not brought out to the public until very recently or well, rather recently in time following another um, uh, trial that took place in, in London, a libel trial involving Deborah Lipstadt, whom we will also speak about in more detail very shortly. But basically, uh, these memoirs that he wrote, uh, Adolf Eichmann went into details of trying to justify his own deeds during the Holocaust. What he said principally in the memoirs was um, he spoke about uh, the fact that he was a mere cog in the wheel. And he even drew diagrams in that memoir and, uh, you know, spoke about how he was really low down in the hierarchy, the whole pyramid structure of the the, the Nazis, the Third Reich. So he was he was trying desperately to show his innocence uh, in all the deeds, in all the crimes that he was accused for. So I think um, the appearance of this, uh, well, let's just say minor character in the novel is important for us today. And that's why we have Rob. So without much ado, without much ado, I would love to hear more from you about what you feel about the appearance of Eichmann as a character in this novel and how you feel it's important vis-a-vis -vis the existential writings uh, of Kurt Vonnegut as a whole. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Um, of course, uh, I think you had you'd, um, uh, told me that uh, the Eichmann trial was televised and, and it would have been very much in the air, certainly, uh, at the time uh, that Vonnegut's writing this. Uh, as I said, I'm not sure exactly when he started this book, but clearly the uh, the hunting of Nazis, uh, Semmen Wiesenthal and, and others. In, in fact, um, the very first chapter, very first page, if you'll pardon me, um, uh, uh, of the chapter one, um, uh, Howard says, uh, I address this book of mine to Mr. Tuvia Friedman, director of the Haifa Institute for Documentation of War Criminals. And I looked up the name, which is spelled differently, so it may be fudging it a bit, but Tuvia Friedman is a, apparently a well-known Nazi hunter who was instrumental in helping to catch Heichmann. So uh, that by itself made me think, ah, you know, Vonnegut is clearly blending in, uh, obviously, real-world people. Uh, Goebbels is mentioned, obviously. Hitler is mentioned. But um, there's a chapter, chapter 29, is actually called Adolf Eichmann and Me. And it uh, recounts how uh, Howard Campbell, after uh, being arrested and, and going to Israel um, for trial, or for detention and then later for trial, uh, encountered Eichmann very briefly, who was in his own jail cell, uh, 
and working on his own memoirs, uh, presumably the, the real memoirs that you, you refer to. Um, and uh, in, in the chapter, we, we have a bit of an exchange um, between Howard, a fictional character who uh, obviously didn't exist in real life, but within the fictional world that Eichmann is also in of the novel, uh, Howard Campbell would have been a very famous propagandist. Like he worked for Joseph Goebbels. He was on the radio every day. I, uh, obviously, Eichmann would know who he is uh, as a sort of Nazi uh, personality, I suppose. Um, and this is where uh, uh, I had mentioned this to, to Saba uh, before. Um, uh, basically, um, uh, Howard asks him, you know, uh, how does it feel like to have six million lives? You know, uh, uh, um, uh, you, you know, uh, on your on your uh, account, as it were. Um, he, he, this is uh, the, I can quote it directly. Actually, do you feel that you're guilty of murdering six million Jews? And the Eichmann of of this novel says, and this is the way Vonnegut writes it. Absolutely not," said the architect of Auschwitz, the introducer of conveyor belts into crematoria, the greatest customer in the world for a gas called Cyclone B. Right, referring to yes. the, the the genocide itself. And then it continues, if you'll allow, um, uh, not knowing the man for sure, I tried some intramural satire on him, what seemed to me to be intramural satire. Quote, uh, you were simply a soldier, were you? I said, taking orders from the higher ups like soldiers all around the world. And then Eichmann gets very mad and starts uh, uh, talking to the guard very quickly, uh, demanding how it is that Howard got his statement. <laughs> and so uh, he, he promises Eichmann that he has not seen his statement. Um, he, and Eichmann says, then how did you know what my defense is going to be? And we get this paragraph. This man actually believed he had invented his own trite defense, though a whole nation of 90 some odd million had made the same defense before him. <laughs> Such was the paltry understanding of the godlike act of human invention. And um, the scene actually ends, well, there's a little postscript, but this particular scene ends with Eichmann saying to Howard, he says, uh, oh, Howard, um, about those six million, I, I can probably spare one or two for you if you'd like to use them in your memoirs. <laughs> and, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a grisly thing to say, you know, the idea that, you know, uh, um, Part of it is um, presumably that uh, Eichmann is saying you too are guilty. You know, if if, if I'm guilty, then then you share some of that guilt. Um, I think is is uh, what is at least implied in that. Yeah. We we later find on the very last page of the chapter that um, uh, there was one other smuggled note sent to him from Eichmann, mm -hmm. and it was strictly about writing, uh, becoming a writer. The note is, do you think a literary agent is absolutely necessary? And Howard Campbell responds, for book clubs and movie sales in the United States, absolutely. <laughs> um, and that's another thing Vonnegut does, or Campbell does in this, is that Eichmann is delighted to be writing his memoirs because he's a writer now. He feels so creative. He's doing something. And uh, much like we talked about with the banality of evil, even though he's writing about his role in killing six million people. He's, he's excited about whether or not he needs a literary agent because he's going to be a famous writer now. <laughs> That's right. And, and so my question, a follow-up question on this is, um, there, there are two, I think, questions I have about this passage that you quoted, with the passages you've quoted, rather. The first one is, do you, how is Eichmann depicted in this novel? Is he uh, because I think it comes back to what, uh, you know, Hannah Arendt, there are two main scholars who've written about Eichmann. There's Hannah Arendt, there's Deborah, and there's Deborah Dipstadt. And I just wanted to, to get a feel of how you felt, uh, how you thought uh, Eichmann was depicted in this novel. Is he really, I think the general impression, is he really ridiculed? Um, I think ridiculed, I, I think in, in a sort of subtle way we're supposed to see him as ridiculous, mm -hmm. right? Here's a guy who is on trial for mass murder, war crimes, uh, 
maybe the most horrific crimes in the history of humankind. And he is excited about being a writer. And, and he uh, admits to not feeling guilty in the least about any crimes because he was just doing his job. Um, he even asks, you know, because he's addressing a guy that he knows to be a professional writer, um, Howard W. Campbell, he asks questions like, well, do you find that, um, you know, uh, writers need to keep to a schedule or do you just write when inspiration hits? You know, a writerly question yeah. because he's, he's, he's excited to be, you know, as I say, um, uh, in, in the position he's in, which I think we are supposed to see as um, the, this guy is an absurd figure. And again, I, I think the banality of evil argument, the idea that, you know, we, we would like to imagine a, a Nazi and especially one as guilty as this guy uh, as being ghoulish you know, the embodiment of evil, some sort of, you know, monstrous figure. And he is a bureaucrat. He's, he's, a, he's a middle management. Uh, I'm not letting him off the hook for being merely in the middle, but I am just saying he acts like the sort of people that you would encounter in, in, in daily life. People who, for example, um, might be delighted that they're about to be famous, even though what they're about to be famous for is so horrible. And so, yeah, I would say that the the irony and and uh, whatnot in this um, is is pretty thick, uh, but uh, you know it does get at the broader issue we were talking about in the book, which is that you know even the most seemingly evil actors are often you know normal people, maybe even good people. You know, uh, it certainly you know decent fathers or you know people who as I said, listen to Mozart and, you know, read books. They're not, you know, again, they're not uh, uh, creatures, you know, crawling up from the, the, you know, the underworld or something like that. And, and that then, of course, puts us all in a difficult position. Like the the whole, what would you have done? Yes. You know. And I think I, I, I asked this question principally because I think of how, for instance, Hannah Arendt depicted uh Eichmann as being a pathetic bureaucrat, you know, uh, very contrary to what ha to what Deborah Lipstadt did many, many years later when uh, she too wrote a book and um, she wrote, uh, uh, Hannah Arendt wrote uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem and she wrote the Eichmann trial specifically. And in that book, um, she laid emphasis on the fact that uh, Hannah Arendt may have gotten her facts wrong and that um, Eichmann was actually very much a culprit in everything that he did. And that was very easily decipherable through uh, the notes that he kept, the mm -hmm. voluminous notes that he had collected over, over time, where he basically um, was responsible for many more int intricate procedures that were implemented uh, during the in, during the Holocaust in the gassing of Jews, among many other things. So I think it's interesting that uh, the depiction of Eichmann here coincides with what Hannah Arendt says, rather than uh, Deborah Lipstadt's take on on the way in which he's depicted. That was what I was very interested by. Uh, you know, I wouldn't. Um, I haven't read Deborah Lipstadt's book, uh, so I, I don't know. But I think that. Hannah Arendt's uh, position uh, may be, at least in part, uh, a philosopher looking down on bureaucrats, right? She's brilliant. He's not as brilliant as she is. Uh, and I, I think pathetic bureaucrat, I agree, is probably not right. Very competent bureaucrat, a uh, very skilled bureaucrat, somebody who figured out and probably took some great pride in figuring out a very difficult a uh, problem, which is how can you kill the most people in the most efficient way? Uh, if it were simply a, 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 a thought exercise, it would be something that someone would have to be very clever to figure out. And so I agree with the Lipstadt treatment in that sense that, yes, he's not just taking orders and he doesn't really know what he's doing. He, I think he knows what he's doing, um, but that doesn't make him any less of a bureaucrat. It just makes him a very good one. I really like that nuance you just made about, you know, just differentiating between how Hannah Arendt would have looked upon him from a philosopher's perspective, because rightly so in her comments, she had a larger project. She was a political philosopher. 
um, and and she she would uh, pr- pr- profusely, voluminously about many other matters. And so I think Eichmann was just one of the subjects, or one of the themes that she tackled throughout her career. So I like the fact that you you drew that uh, that that difference, that that nuance. You pointed that that out because in her criticism of Eichmann, for instance, Hannah Arendt focused on for in, for things on things such as um, you know he misunderstood the categorical imperative and, and, and such things. Whereas, of course, the truth is we should look at him, at, at Eichmann, as uh, whether he was compet- competent in his uh, skills as a bureaucrat, exactly as what you said. Building off of what you just mentioned about Hannah Arendt's approach to, let's say, discussing Eichmann, what would Kurt Vonnegut's approach necessarily be? Is it to, in fact, um, to exaggerate or to ridicule, but um, or perhaps to display a caricature, or is it to judge? Uh, I, I think actually, kind of neither. I mean, I, obviously, as I said, he's, he's he's depicted as a figure somewhat absurd. Uh, again, this sort of uh, starstruck in a way by the fact that he's now going to be famous. Uh, seems like a very odd way to depict uh, a guy who's on trial for the, these heinous crimes and, and certainly going to be under a death sentence for them as well. Um, so in that sense, I, I do think it's uh, somewhat ridiculous, but he definitely presents it as the banality of evil kind of argument in the sense that this is not, uh, as I said, a monstrous figure. This is a sort of absurd mm-hmm. <laughs> guy. And I, uh, like I, you know, I I think that Vonnegut has said this elsewhere. Like in the first chapter of Slaughterhouse Five, he talks about how uh, none of his books have um, villains or or heroes. Really, like everybody's flawed, everybody's got problems, um, and he, he claims that he learned that from when he was in school studying anthropology, and that anthropology is a field that is the study of man and that there's no inherently evil person or inherently good person that uh, we just have, you know, various habits and mores and whatnot. And and so I think that that may be part of it too. Um, you know, Vonnegut, um, we were talking about this before, I think. Vonnegut was himself German, you know, in, in his 1966 preface to the reissue of this book in hardcover, he, he admits that had he been born in Germany, he probably would have been a Nazi. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's not, you know, he certainly is not a Nazi sympathizer. Uh, this is not his admission that I, I too am a Nazi. It's, it's his admission that, you know, I, you know uh, as, as an American from Indianapolis, you know, I joined the U.S. Army. If I had been a German from Berlin, maybe I would have joined the German Army. Like, you know, he, he is, of course, German-American, the Vonnegut family, very proud of their... German background and his uh, both of his grandfathers immigrated from Germany in the 19th century and uh, found great uh, success in Indianapolis. Uh, uh, the Vonnegut family name at one point uh, apparently Vonnegut Hardware. His grandfather's business was the largest hardware store in Indiana. So you know, great That's great right. uh, background. And and yet, of course, he's he, he, like I said, he's he's willing to admit for for all of that. You know, I am certainly capable of horrible things as well. Now, he's not necessarily saying I'm capable of genocide, but he probably would have been capable of being a guard in one of the camps if that was the job assigned to him. Now, you mentioned something before about in the preface of the book, Kurt Vonnegut meant, or, or brings up the idea that this is the only book that he wrote that he has or knows the moral of. Can you expand on what that moral was and how does it take place in the novel? Yeah, it, well, it's, it's, it's really interesting because um, uh, in this book, uh, as I said, when it comes out in, I guess, first printed in February of um, 62, it's, it's very much presented as the um, confessions of Howard W. Campbell. I, I, I brought the like the original paperback where it, even in the marketing, it makes it look like, even though it says Kurt Vonnegut Jr., it says an American trader's astonishing confession, uh, you know, written with unnatural candor in a foreign death cell. Well, you know, that's the fiction, of course. That's that's Howard W. Campbell. And then uh, the original had an, what is called an editor's note signed by Kurt Vonnegut Jr., mm-hmm. the suggestion being that a guy named Kurt Vonnegut Jr. is merely editing Howard Campbell's things. And 
um, in, in that editor's note, this is even before the, the question you ask, uh, the, the later 1966 preface, um, you know, he, he actually says, um, uh, Campbell was a writer as well as a person accused of extremely serious crimes, a one-time playwright of moderate reputation. To say that he was a writer is to say that the demands of art alone were enough to make him lie and to lie without seeing any harm in it. To say he was a playwright is to offer an even harsher warning to the reader, for no one is a better liar than a man who has warped lives and passions onto something as grotesquely artificial as the stage. So in, in the book itself, it's warning the reader that what you're about to read might not be true. Now, I, in fairness, I should probably quote the next paragraph too, where he says, in some ways, artful lies might get at the deeper truths, you know, that which is almost a cliche. Um, but to go to what you were talking about, uh, he writes an, a new introduction in 1966 when the book is released uh, in, in hardcover. By then, he's published two more novels. So um, Mother Night is his third novel. By then, he has five, and he's already working on Slaughterhouse-Five, which is, of course, going to become his most famous novel and still is his most famous but uh, this is what you were citing. Um, this, is the one, this is the only story of mine whose moral I know. I don't think it's a marvelous moral. I simply happen to know what it is. And then he has a colon to tell us what it is. We are what we pretend to be, so we must be careful about what we pretend to be. And of course, you are what you pretend to be is a powerful and of course paradoxical thing, you know. Um, uh, obviously, if you're being true to yourself, you're being authentic, you're not pretending. And he's saying, well, you know, if you are pretending, that winds up being what you are after all. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, there is, of course, uh, it, it's meant to be paradoxical. It's meant to cause us a little consternation. Uh, hey, wait a second. I was just play acting. The fact that this guy's a playwright is, I, I think, significant in that regard. You know, I'm 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 not Polonius. I'm just playing Polonius. You know, uh, until Hamlet stabs me, and then I, I'll be out of the play. <laughs> okay. um, and there's there's a there's another key moment. If you'll forgive me for quoting, I'm sorry. Well, this, is, this is this is really do. Um, <clears throat> it's it's my favorite moment, and it's it's also for me maybe the most powerful moment um, where this is recounting the scene at the very end of the war. Um, you know, the Russians have, uh, you know, uh, marched into Berlin. Um, Howard Campbell is trying to escape like, like other Nazis. And his blue fairy godmother, as he calls him, the, uh, the American uh, military agent who had recruited him to, to work for the U.S. Uh, interests while, while broadcasting for the Nazis, meets him and is going to help him successfully get out of there. He talks about how, you know, we'll do what we can to... To, to, to allow you to disappear, basically. We'll give you a little cash and we'll try to set you up somewhere, but then you're on your own. But um, in, in this sort of conversation they're having, uh, uh, Howard learns uh, from his uh, blue fairy godmother, let me give him his name, Frank Wirtanen is the name that he's given in, in the text, which is itself a, a pseudonym, and a fake name and a pretend name. But... Um, Frank Rutanen, uh lets him know uh, he, he, you know, uh, that you know his his uh, radio broadcast had been helpful during the war and all of this, um, but you know uh, we had, we couldn't tell anybody right because it was so top secret. He informs him, for example, that his father and his mother had died and they, nobody had let him know that they they lived in uh, you know the U.S. in Connecticut, um, and in in fact. Um, we get this question in that chapter. Um, uh, how many people knew what I was doing? I said, the good things or the bad things? He said, the good, three of us. That's all? That's a lot. Too many, really. There was me, there was General um, Donner, uh, Donovan, and one other. Um, three people in all the world knew me for what I was? And all the rest, they knew who you were too, he said abruptly, right? Uh, I'm sorry, they knew, they knew you for what you were too, he said abruptly. That wasn't me, I said, startled by his sharpness. Whoever it was, said Bertanen, 
He was one of the most vicious sons of bitches who's ever lived. And I was amazed. Rutanen was sincerely bitter. You give me hell for that, knowing what you do? How else could I have survived? That was your problem. Very few men could have solved it as thoroughly as you did. You think I was a Nazi? Certainly you were. How else would a responsible historian classify you? And of course, this is that moment. Well, you, for many years, you pretended to be a Nazi. How, how could you not? And um, he then, uh, it, he follows that up, Wartan uh, follows that up by saying, let me ask you a question. And he, we can already guess what the question is. What if the Germans had won the war? What would you do then? Would, would you like, you know, and they, we know, would you secretly be poisoning Nazi officers, uh, you know, putting bombs in their basements? Or, no, of course not. He, he admits doing the thought experiment that he probably would have gone on to be a beloved. He, he, the example he gives, which I had to look up, um, uh, but I assume Vonnegut's readers in 1962 would have known this. He says, there is any, every chance I would have become a sort of Nazi Edgar Guest writing a daily column of optimistic, optimistic doggerel for um, papers around the world. And I did look up who Edgar Guest was, who did write sort of fun, uh, upbeat poems in newspapers in the, in the, in the 40s, I guess. Uh, and so he, he's admitting that, you know, he'd just go on and live in the now Nazi world and live very well, um, not being a, a hero, of course, and not in his own mind being a villain. But uh, the reason I, I get to this is that he's so shocked that someone who actually knows that he was doing good would still classify him this way. And uh, in a way, it, it is true. Even if you were doing good, which uh, at the end of the very end of the book, the Blue Fairy Godmother character writes a letter um, to, for the court to use saying, it's true, I did recruit him, you know. Uh, basically letting Howard W. Campbell off the hook by, by telling the truth. But it's also true that the Nazi broadcasts, the propaganda that Howard uh, Campbell gave on the radio, e even if it did also provide information for the U.S. war effort, was still vicious, horrible stuff. <laughs> and to the extent that, um, you know, a genocide is possible not only because there are troops and trains and barbed wire and cyclone gas, you know, uh, but also because there's a population willing to be okay with this. There's a population that thinks that maybe certain types of people shouldn't be in this society anymore. Well, then those radio broadcasts help to build that society and help to build that uh, consensus, or at least a popular view. And in that sense, Howard Campbell is guilty, like Eichmann is guilty, not in the same way exactly, but, you know, that's what um, Frank Wirtanen is getting at, but this notion of uh, any responsible historian would have to call you a Nazi. <laughs> and I think uh, what is interesting is also the fact that Howard Campbell is not aware, there's always an element of, of obscurity that's involved in anything that we take up in any sort of process that we're part of. So the lack of knowledge he has, which he uses in a way to uh, evoke our empathy, our sympathy for him, that doesn't really work in the bigger picture of things because we all know that in any role we play in life, there's always, we're not always aware of what we're doing in the bigger picture of things. And Howard Campbell is also not aware of everything that's happening as a result of his deeds. And so this point also sort of like for me, brings up this other fact that I think about, this other factor I, I kept thinking about I, while I was reading the novel, which is basically um, all of these characters are trying to minimize their crimes, whether it's Eichmann or whether it's Howard Campbell here in the novel, because again, back to what was mentioned in the in the editor's note that you read earlier, mm -hmm. um, when when uh, you know it's mentioned that what you're reading might not be true, whatever uh, Howard Campbell is is talking about in his novel might not be entirely true as well because it's confessional, and as we know, confessions are made up of rationalizations and justifications of, about what we do. So what we find in every trial, this is part of the research that I've done previously, is that say when you have secondary 
a second secondary level perpetrators or mid level perpetrators such as Eichmann, typically in a in a court trial, they will say, "Don't compare me to Himmler. Right. I'm not Himmler." I mean, that's right. exactly what he actually right. said in his trial. Right. Or, for instance, you will have. Um, um, primary perpetrators, you know, the, those who work at the top level, who will also be comparing themselves to others and say, I didn't kill as many people as he did. But in the end, that argument doesn't really hold water because these people have still been guilty for the deaths of millions of thousands or millions. It doesn't really matter in the end. So having said that, I think um, an approach to this novel would also be to be a little skeptical about the account that is given, the confessional account that is presented to us. Yeah, you know, uh, it's it's interesting. One of the things that we learn over the course of the novel about Howard W. Campbell is that he, he is, and this is part of why he, he was recruited, his his one play that was really successful in Germany uh, was about a medieval knight, you know, um, who was seeking the Holy Grail or something like that. And, and it, it's imbued with all of this sort of romantic idealism. Uh, and And in fact, Campbell himself believes that he has this sort of um, romantic idealism, you know, whatever I look like on the outside, notwithstanding, deep within, I am, I am, you know, a pure, pure, uh, chaste, you know, uh, you know, medieval knight. Um, and this is something I think Vonnegut, if we're reading it at like a, a, a slight distance from the, the, the uh, text itself, is reminding us that, you know, we often feel that way, but then uh, it turns out we're not. So, uh, you know, one of the things that is a, more of a minor part of the book uh, relative to what we're talking about, but the fact that he writes uh, what turns out apparently to be a pornographic book about his monogamous relationship, The Confessions of Monogamous Casanova, because he loves his wife so much and uh, Helga Noth, uh, and that he uh, is utterly devoted to her in a, in a way that, you know, he would never, of course, cheat on his wife. And then we find out later that he does cheat on his wife uh, with her sister, uh, somewhat unbeknownst to him, but he, he then talks about being a polygamist, monogamous, <laughs> whatever. And, and much like being a traitor who's also maybe a patriot, you know, a monogam, uh, you know, monogamist who actually turns out to be a bigamist, uh, and so on. He has all of these things that undercut his his own sense of authenticity or or being true to himself because he's not ultimately able to be true to himself. Again, to go back to the nineteen sixty six preface, if I may, um, this is of course a famous line in its own right, where. Vonnegut, again, being a German-American, um, uh, sorry, um, you know, um, it, 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 you know, uh, American, uh, you know, fighting for the United States during the war, he, he admits at the end of that uh, 1966 introduction, he says, if I had been born in Germany, I suppose I would have been a Nazi, bopping Jews and gypsies and Poles around leaving boots sticking out of snowbanks, warming myself with my secret, secretly virtuous insides. And that, that last clause is the one people often drop. They're like, well, sure, yeah, if you'd been born in Germany, you might well have been a Nazi. But he's like, I would have been doing all of those things, but warming myself with my secretly virtuous insides. And that, of course, is, is the, the notion that... Um, I, I don't want to make it sound like it's incredibly profound. It's it, it's probably not, but nobody, to go back to the banality of evil argument, nobody says, let's go do some evil, right? I mean, maybe some villain in some silly movie pretending to be a Satanist, uh, you know, uh, in, in Milton, you know, Satan does say, evil be thou my good, reversal of values, but even then he wants it to be good, you know, uh, no, I, you know, uh, I'm sure that none of these people said, I'm going to go do evil today. They think they're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. they, they may feel bad about it because they know it's a terrible thing, but they still think they're in the right for it, or that even if it's a bad thing, they're not bad people, you know. Uh, and I think that gets at the, well, at least I'm not Himmler, you know. <laughs> 
um, you, you know, the comparative evil makes me look better at least. And yeah, that that's secretly warming, uh, my, warming myself with my secretly virtuous insides. This is interesting because it goes back to um, the idea or what we've been talking about in genocide studies as well when we speak about right now, especially. Um, we're speaking about how it is in, it, very easy for us to be led into believing that we are doing the right thing at all costs. And sometimes we use such words as, you know, we're doing this to uphold the honor of our house or our society, our family, our tribe. And these are ways in which we actually uh, perpetrate evil. We actually indulge in, in evil doing. So I want to bring out the fact that I think one of the discussions, one of the many discussions I've come across recently in genocide studies is about the importance of self-criticism, the self-critical exercise where you know, subjectively, it's very easy to think that what we are doing is for the greater good. But it's always important to take a step back from whatever we are doing, to look at the bigger picture of, thing, to look at, of things, to look at the consequences of our actions, and look at whether objectively, according to, you know, uh, the, the bigger aspirations we may have for the good of society, whether whatever we are doing is not actually hurting and harming other people. So I think this is brought out very well in the passages that you just mentioned, because we may very easily be led to think that we're virtuous. Mm -hmm. Everybody involved in this game and, and Howard Campbell is is probably a very good, um, um, you know, he, he emulates this idea of the dualism involved, the, the falsehood of that dualism of good and evil, which is involved because he is on both sides. Mm -hmm. And I think there is also something to be said about the prescience of this novel, because in those days, when in the 60s, especially when this novel was written, we were still caught up with, uh, with, with these, um, you know, uh, 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 with, with these sort of like simplistic narratives about the Holocaust, where it was either seen from a perpetrator's perspective or it was either seen from a survivor's perspective. And so I think what is good about this, what's laudable about this novel is that it brings through the character of Howard Campbell, we have the reconciliation of these two warring parties, that is, of course, mm -hmm. the Allies and the other side brought together, the, the Third Reich brought together in the character of Howard Campbell. So um, that definitely goes to the credit of Vonnegut's writing here. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that... Um well, I did, you know, I did write write a book on Vonnegut's all of Vonnegut's novels um, uh, years ago, and um, this is, uh, I think, Howard Campbell is unique as a character, but it's a theme that that appears in almost all of the novels of, as I said, you know, the no strictly good or evil. Often, the hero that you might be led to be sort of cheering for the way the the narrative goes does ridiculous things and you realize, oh, uh, you know, that, that he shouldn't have done that or he shouldn't have been thinking that way. And again, the idea of a, you know, flawed every man kind of figure in, in an extraordinary situation, that's what books are about. Like, that's, that's, that's fairly common. But it, you know, he, it, what makes Fana get very interesting, and I, I don't know if this is part of his appeal to fans, is that he he seems to be quite interested in in morals and in, in you know in in the question of you know uh, good I, I don't know if I want to say good versus evil uh, you know the uh, sort of Nietzschean beyond good and evil but you know how to do your best how to try to be good try to be decent uh, famous line from a 1965 novel God bless you Mr Rosewater has the title character. Um, welcoming newborns to the earth and telling them that uh, there's only one rule that I know of. God damn it, you've got to be kind. Mm -hmm. Because kindness we do have control over. We may not have control over uh, good or evil. Agreed. Uh, in, indeed, I'm not sure that Vonnegut would agree with the way I'm putting it, but we've talked about this. I know you and I have talked about it in terms of like Frederick Jameson discussing the, the dialectical reversal is that so much of what we do, even if we are absolutely certain we're doing the right thing, uh, we have no doubts about it, may be shown in the fullness of time to have been the wrong thing. Yes. Uh, and that some years later you would say, ah, if only I hadn't been doing that, this wouldn't have happened. That's right. Uh, and, you know, any anybody who 
you know, has any sort of historical sensibility and looks back on things can make those connections and say, ah, uh, if only America hadn't done this, the, the Nazis would have never risen to power. Right? Vonnegut has another book called Dead Eye Dick where there's a character whose grandfather is living in Vienna in the teens during World War, uh, just before World War I begins. And he meets a starving artist uh, who is a moderately decent painter named uh, Adolf Hitler. And he buys his painting from him. And it, it's again, fictional, of course, but the idea is that had only my grandfather not bought that, Adolf Hitler probably would have starved to death that winter. He needed that money to buy food. And of course, it's this whole thing of like, you know, I am responsible. My family is responsible for for the, the horrors of the genocide in World War II and all of that because my grandfather took pity on a starving artist and bought his paint. <laughs> if I can ask for some closing thoughts from both of you. Now, what would readers or what would our audience gain from reading Kurt Vonnegut and especially Mother Night? But first, I would like to start with you, Sabah, especially given that this is a book with the perpetrator as the main character. What place do, let's say, um, discussion of genocide has in literature and in art overall? I think it's important um, to remember that aside from scholarly writing on genocide, arts and literature, generally speaking, has something different to tell us about all of these stories, all of these accounts that we want to document as scholars of genocide. And because um, these accounts tell us you know, something different, they're telling us something more that we should basically take into consideration. So I don't see, for instance, the field of academia and the field of arts and literature on the other, on the other hand as two different fields. I think both must be reconciled all the time. For instance, even this novel here uh, brings up the complex question about good and evil, as we discussed, and it also brings up uh, other complex matters as, you know, what would have been the outcome had the Allies, had the Allies actually not won, you know, the war in the end and how everything would have been, you know, turned around. So I think um, in delving into scholarly works on genocide, it's also important to keep a foot in everything else that's been written, because everything else, arts and literature, novels, short stories, tell us more. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Talley? Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. Um, uh, you know, if I wanted to talk about big themes, uh, you could say that one of the themes that appears over and over again in Vonnegut is the sense of the fall, uh, and specifically the the fall from the Garden of Eden. I, I want to quote my sources here. Um, there's a wonderful study, one of the early and great scholarly studies of Vonnegut by a scholar named Leonard Mustaza was called Forever Pursuing Genesis, uh, the Eden myth in, in the novels of Kurt Vonnegut, something like that. But it is true, we didn't talk about it today, but in this book he talks about uh, how he and his wife in their bedroom formed a Reich der Zwei, uh, a nation of two. And it happens in many of his books, almost all of his books at one point or another have a man and a woman sheltered, sometimes even underground, but in their own little enclave, a little Edenic moment before, of course, it all goes to hell, <laughs> which is what happens here too. Uh, and so I, I feel like uh, in general for Vonnegut, there is this sense of, you know, a lost paradise that is the fate of man. And, and it sounds much more religious than I probably should say about a man who uh, is notoriously humanist and atheist, although he referred to himself as a Christ-loving agnostic, uh, so a, a very uh, Christian-minded non-Christian. Um, but I would say that, that that's one of the themes that, that you get in reading Vonnegut. And for this book especially, I think just what I was saying about the ambiguities of being human and therefore the difficulties uh, with trying to uh, definitively make moral judgments. I mean, what, I, what I'm really, I'm not opposed to morality, I'm opposed to moralizing, I guess. And I think this goes to the theme of the, the podcast itself, which is that, you know, we're, we're, we're not forgiving, but we're here to understand. And, you know, we have to also not necessarily 
definitively condemn uh, as if we were dealing with pure evil, but recognize that the evildoers in question are themselves you know, human. And that's, that's part of Vonnegut as well. I do want to touch on a last question before we end. Um, I think I'm very interested in, while I was reading this novel uh, and I was delighted by the dark humor therein, I was also, uh, I also started to question myself as a novelist uh, in terms of just the, the sensitivities that, are, that prevail today in our culture and how a lot of us feel, a lot of us as writers feel the pressure right now in terms of expressing ourselves because there are so many words that we can't use there's there's so much humor that we can't indulge in anymore so what do you feel about um how this novel would potentially be received if it were to be published today it's an excellent question and you know the the idea of course uh, depends a lot on on whether or not we're going to go ahead and believe that howard w campbell was a good guy all along you know, the final page of the novel, when he's definitively exonerated by the, the confession letter of the man who had called himself Frank Wertanen, I think his name is Harry Harold Sparrow. Uh, he gives his real name finally. Um, and again, the whole real versus non-real is, is part of the, the problem. Um, uh, Howard W. Campbell says, at this moment, I'm now uh, free and free of guilt because I've been admitted that I'm uh, th that I was working for the good guys all along, and that prospect disgusts me. And he says, I'm going to hang myself. In Slaughterhouse Five, by the way, Howard W. Campbell briefly appears, and we find out from the narrator of Slaughterhouse Five, who I guess is named Kerr Vonnegut, that uh, Howard W. Campbell later killed himself in his jail cell in, in Jerusalem. <laughs> so uh, he ties in that, that little tidbit from this novel. Um, the very fact that he's now uh, free to imagine himself as good again disgusts him and makes him wonder. Uh, that doesn't quite answer the question. I, I think it is difficult to try to write something that would be sympathetic towards Nazis. <laughs> I, I think that part of what I was saying about morality versus moralizing is that I think we we have a, a stronger sense now that you know sympathizing with someone we think of as immoral is itself immoral, and I, I think that that is of course, horrifying, uh, yes. you know, um, and again, uh, not only because the, those people may be proven to be better than you have thought, uh, but it's too late now because you've already condemned them, but also because it makes us less flexible. Uh, and I think, I think, don't you agree that there is a, well, uh, I, I don't want to put the thoughts in the thought in your head, but I don't want to be, uh, you know, presumptuous here, but I, w I do want to say that because of the moralizing that's happening right now, and the pressure on us as writers to conform to the morals of the time, which are very much like anchored in what's going on today. There is a tendency now that literature is becoming normative in the sense that it's it, the literature that's being produced, the writing that's being produced, at least by those who are so conscious of the sensitivities and the publishers and the public who are sort of like policing that. Sure. Um, I think what's happening is that the literature we're producing is becoming normative in the sense of it's telling us how we should think and how we should be, because it's not offering the possibilities of, say, counter narratives, uh, contrary perspectives on one subject. So in a way, this sort of like um, channeling of ideas, of thoughts, of the moralizing process is really like transforming literature. That's what I see as what's happening in the bigger sphere of things. What do you feel about that? Is that what you feel too? Well, I, I feel like it, it's also, it becomes even more dangerous. We think of, for example, the Nazi censors who not only wouldn't publish things that were written by Jews, but would not uh, countenance, you know, novels that were too sympathetic to the Jewish cause or things like that. Certainly banned works by communists and other things. You think of Stalin and this sort of Stalinist, uh, um, limitations placed on writers and what could be published in, uh, you know, in, in, in the Soviet Union. This was imposed top down by repressive authoritarian regimes. But what we're talking about now is not being imposed top down. Uh, it's being sort of built within uh, a body of people that are more Stalinist and more censorious than any government could possibly be uh, because they don't want you to, to even think those thoughts uh, much less be able to publish them. And, 
sure enough, if, if publishing houses fear boycotts or protests or canceling or whatever, then they will, you know, resonate to that as well. And they're, they're not going to publish it. Then, of course, you know, we have ourselves done the work of the Stalins for us, you know, uh, which is uh, pretty, pretty scary because uh, the more of that, the less ability to deal with ambiguity, the less ability to deal with gray areas. Uh, that seems to me to be uh, something that leads to, to things like genocide. Yeah. You say this type of person, whatever that is, it doesn't have to be a racial category, is bad. The the end of that, we're we're not going to wonder if they're sometimes they're sort of good or they they meant well, you know. Uh, literature and, and not just fiction, but you know, literature has always been good at showing the uh, great nuances and ambiguities and and ironies and as I say, uh, unforeseen uh, consequences. And uh, if we lose that, uh, then, you know, uh, I, I, I fear for us all. <laughs> this was not to forgive, but to understand with our guest, Robert Talley. To our listeners, don't forget to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more discussions. If you would like to see and hear more from our guest, he will be speaking on the role of literature on genocide, perpetration or prevention. At the Genocide Awareness Symposium held in April 2024, at Texas State University.